Will you turn with me to the book of Exodus and to the 40th chapter? Exodus chapter 40. And we shall read the first five verses. And uh, the Lord speak unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and uh, thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with the veil. And uh, thou shalt bring in the table, and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And uh, thou shalt bring in the candlestick, and light the lamp thereof. And thou shalt set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony, and put the hanging of the door to the tabernacle. The uh, divine record of uh, the tabernacle is a story of absorbing interest. It uh, presents a field of study at uh, once beautiful and edifying. Uh, we are not left in doubt as to its true meaning in the camp of Israel. You remember that the writer to the Hebrews speaks of it as a shadow of heavenly things, or as we have it in our Gaelic Bible, a shadow of things that are heavenly. Now this morning I am not going to speak of shadows, or of type, we have both in this interesting record. What I purpose doing this morning, uh, tomorrow morning and the following morning, is to direct your attention to three thoughts suggested by the story. Uh, today we shall consider the time of its setting up. On the first day of the first month, set up the tabernacle. Uh, tomorrow we shall consider the purpose of its setting up, that I may dwell among you. And on the third morning, the place of its setting up in the midst of the camp of Israel. And now this morning, consider with me the time of its setting up. On the first day of the first month, set up the tabernacle. Now it seems to me that these words have a message, at least they have a message for me. Are they not suggestive of new beginnings? Some little time ago it was my privilege to listen to one of our great Scottish preachers, Professor James S. Stewart, and he was on this occasion speaking on the subject of revival. And this is what he said, revival is a new discovery of Jesus and his power to save, suggesting a new beginning. Now is the Christian life not made up of new beginnings? I believe, dear people, 
that uh, while it is true that there comes an hour when we enter into saving and covenant relationship with God, when God stoops down or comes down so to breathe and glory crowns the mercy seat, and we discover for the first time that heaven hath invaded the soul and God our Savior has become supremely real. It is equally true that there ever must be in my mind and heart this conviction that I must begin every new day with a new beginning with God. I recall the words of Hezekiah. There was an hour in his life when he registered a new beginning. In the following words, I found it in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel. And I frequently say to my students in Edinburgh that it is a good thing in the early hours of our meeting with God to make a covenant with Him that that day will find us walking with Him, talking with Him, and listening ever to the voice that gives direction through every hour of every single day. Yes, surprising though it seems, it is always God's way to lead us on to new beginnings. I wonder if among those who responded to the appeals yesterday, young men and young women have been found registering a new beginning and saying life Life can never be the same again. It just means that the truth that grips me today must find expression and embodiment in a new building of myself to God. This is a message to those who may have been trying and who today are conscious of defeat. Yes, they have tried again and again. They have knelt in the presence of God and they have said, Never again. Never again will I yield to that temptation. Never again will I be found in that company. Never again will I dishonor the Christ who saved me and the Christ whom I promised to serve us in this convention. And at this hour, because of repeated failures, you are gripped by a sense of baffling and a sense of frustration. And you are saying, can it ever be different? 
Can I ever get back the years that the locusts have eaten? Can the waste places be made again? Can the mar vessel be made? Yes, I say it can be made. It, it is in the hands of the potter. That to me is a glorious truth. I remember some years ago when as a minister conscious of frustration and baffling I found myself prostrate on my face before God wondering if I could ever get back the years that the locusts had eaten, could I ever again register a new beginning with God? And God in his mercy led, led me to that passage in Old Testament story that speaks of the vessel mark. And I kept saying, yes, I mark. Yes, I'm mar. Then suddenly, suddenly, there came to me this glorious conviction that so mar I was still in the hands of the potter. He could have thrown me on the way he he could have left me on the shelf as a castaway. But the hand that gripped me at the moment of my regeneration, the hand that lifted me from the miry clay of sin, was the hand that Still held me so much. And that hand, oh, bless God, that hand could make me again. And I could register, and heaven could record a new beginning. Oh, that this truth may grip us again this morning. A truth spoken by God to his ancient people. He brought them out. Not to leave them in the wilderness. Not to have them ever moving in a dry and parched. He brought them out that he might bring them in. Now I'm speaking to some today. You have been brought out. Egypt is behind and I trust behind forever. But yet in a wilderness experience, grumbling, grumbling, conscious that things are not just what you had hoped they would be. Listen, my friend, the God who brought you out is the God who is anxious to bring you in and in that very wilderness experience you can build a tabernacle and you can register a new beginning for God. I think just now of one of our own workers. She was mightily used in revival, wonderfully used in revival. 
But if the devil can push you down, he'll push you up. And the devil got in and pushed her up. She was the instrument used in revival. She was the instrument used to lead hundreds of God's people into a deeper experience of God. And Satan came and told her that. As I already said, if he can push you down, he'll push you up. And he pushed her up. There came a day when the Holy Spirit of God brought that revelation to that young woman. What happened? She had a nervous breakdown. Smashed, broken, until at last she even went as far as to wonder if she was ever born again. Oh, how the devil can get her. How the powers of darkness can hold her. How necessary it is in every stage of Christian experience on the mountain or in the valley to be in vital contact with God. My brother and sister, you will stay only when you're there. She had slipped out somehow and for three long months she was in darkness, in terrible darkness, until one day in her bedroom she reads the word, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. And she, in that wonderful hour, recognized the voice that was speaking through that word. And to her mind there came the thought, the gospel of a second chance. And I'm glad today that I can proclaim the gospel of a second chance. Not on the other side of the grave, but here. There's no second chance over there. As the tree falleth, so shall it lie. As death finds you, so will judgment. That is not commonly believed today. Oh no! The damnable doctrine of universalism is eating up the very vital of truth and Christian experience. I think I ought to tell you here because it comes to my mind. An experience that I had some time ago, I was asked to address a conference of ministers in Oxford. There must have been between 80 and 100 ministers gathered, and I was asked to speak on the Holy Ghost in evangelism. But they suggested that I might select the uh, closing address myself. So I choose as my subject for the closing address the goodness and the severity of God. The goodness and the severity. And of course I spoke of judgment. And I spoke of hell. 
where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. After the meeting, those responsible for bringing me to Oxford asked if they could see me in the vestry of the church. I naturally thought that they were gathering there to pay my traveling expenses. That was all that I had in my mind. But I tell you, I found something very different. They shut the door. Now listen, they were all reputed to be evangelical men. As a matter of fact, they were having nights of prayer for this minister's conference. And they were men who took coach loads to Harringay to listen to Dr. Billy Gray. Of course, they were evangelical men. As I thought, but listen to them now. Mr. Campbell, surely you do not believe in the hell of the Puritan? I looked at them and said, now what do you mean by the hell of the Puritan? I believe in the hell that Christ believed in. Of the hell that the New Testament speaks about. The wicked shall be cast into hell, says the Old Testament, and the nations that forget God. That's the hell that I believe in. The chairman looked at me and said, Had we known that these were your views and convictions, we would never have asked you to address this conference, evangelical men. My dear people, that's the day in which we're living. No wonder the stream of vital Christianity is running so low and sin is walking unashamed through our court. One brother spoke and said, uh, Mr. Campbell, you must not misunderstand us. We believe in judgment. We believe in the second death. But the second death is death. It's annihilation. If you accept Christ, you're immortal. If you reject Christ, you die like your dog. No. No second chance there. But thank God, a second chance here. I wouldn't be standing before you this morning did God not give me a second chance. Oh, think of Jonah for a little. The word of the Lord came to him the second time that he, Jonah, had failed. And as he lay there, on the shores of Nineveh, oh, he is conscious, very, very conscious of his failure. And then God comes. Oh, thank God, he comes. Has he come to you? Did he come to you last night? Did he come to you yesterday afternoon? Did he come to you yesterday morning? Speaking words of rebuke. Speaking words of correction. Speaking words of deep conviction relative to your failures. 
I'm to your sin. But did he come with a word of pardon? Who forgiveth all thine iniquity? Who healeth all wonderful words? Who healeth all? Oh, how I thank God for that word, all. All thy deceased. As I go up and down the country today in Britain, I find that many of God's dear people are deceived. Oh, I could tell you story after story of young men deceived and gripped by a sin that I wouldn't soil my lips by mentioning. Just four months ago, sitting in my study, the telephone rang. The long distance call, my secretary said. So I went to the phone. A young man from Cambridge is anxious to speak to me. Mr. Campbell, I was listening to you in Westminster Chapel last week, and I'm terribly disturbed. Can I see you? Could I see you on Saturday in Edinburgh? No, I'm sorry, I'm to be in Aberdeen on Saturday. Then can I see you in Aberdeen? Oh, you see, this man was in desperation. In desperation. Yes, you can see me in Aberdeen. Then I shall fly to Glasgow and train from Glasgow to Aberdeen if I cannot get a suitable plane. So in Aberdeen I met him. And I cannot tell you the sin that gripped that young man except to say this, that it was the sin of impurity. Impurity. A sin that is too prevalent today in the student community. And I'm not talking in ignorance. I'm not talking in ignorance. I've worked too long among students in Britain. I can only speak, of course, for Britain. But that young man told me a story. Yes, he was actively engaged in the Christian Union. He was assisting art campaigns and crusades in different parts of England under the auspices of the InterVarsity Fellowship. But he was deceived by a sin that conquered him and conquered him and conquered him again. Was there deliverance? Could he be delivered? from this awful sin that damned Sodom. Could he be delivered? And I'm thankful to say that as we knelt together and I spoke of him who was manifested to destroy the works of the devil, but he suddenly came to see that the God who said the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses from all, this is the word all again, cleanses from all sins, he could cleanse him from the him that mastered him and kept him in bondage. 
I am thankful to say that that young man who registered a new beginning and today he is a curate in a church of England and I believe the day will not be long until he will be a vicar in one of our evangelical churches in England. God gloriously delivered him and in that room he built a tabernacle in the wilderness and registered a new beginning. Oh, am I speaking to any here and you are fettered. You are bound and you loathe yourself for yielding so often. You loathe yourself and again and again you have said it. If the principal knew my thought and my desire and my action, he would send me home. Have you said that? Have you said that? I remember not so very long ago we were having our time of prayer in the college. They are just there now in Edinburgh. They'll be praying for us. We spend Friday morning on our knees. Lectures put aside. Everything else put aside. The way up on God. Well, some time ago, while waiting upon God, one of our Highland students, born again in the Jewish revival, was suddenly caught up in God. Do you know, friend, what it means to be caught up in God? The Spirit of God fell upon that gathering, and we were on our faces till twenty past four. Lunch was forgotten. Oh, it's wonderful to be in such a meeting. A meeting that left its mark upon staff and students. It was revival in the college. But after that meeting, a young man came to me. Now he was a very keen student with a clear, keen intellect. He came to me. Can I see you, Mr. Campbell, in your study? Yes, I said, you can see me in my study. When do you wish to see me? I want to see you now. So to the study we went. Mr. Campbell, I've just discovered that I was never born again. When Duncan was praying, that revelation came to me. I was never born again. I'm a deceiver. And I'm going home. And he went home the following day. I'm thankful to say that since then he has come into saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And he is now actively engaged in evangelistic efforts in England. But what I want to impress upon you is this, that when God the Holy Ghost came, when the Spirit of God began to work, men and women there discovered things about themselves that they never suspected before, and adjustments had to be made and new beginnings registered. And I trust, 
I pray that something similar to that may happen at this convention. Oh, see him there, prostrate, broken, on the shores of Nineveh. And then God comes to him. Oh, so like God. So like God. God comes and in effect says to him, Jonah, Jonah, here is an opportunity uh, to make a new beginning. You have failed. Yes, you have failed me. But I'm here to speak to you again. You can register a new dedication. You can register a new consecration. I'm here to deal with the sin of disobedience. And I'm here to make you again. And listen, God made him again. Now I have a truth here that we do well to remember and it is this that in recovery as in revival the first step is and remain with God. God came to Jonah and God comes to you. Those convictions that you have, those aspirations that have come. Listen, friends, they have their origin in the sovereign mercy of God. God coming. Yes, in effect, God is saying to Jonah, Jonah, you are in a mess. There can be no doubt at all about that. You're in a wilderness. That is certain. But Jonah, you are just in the place where you can build a tabernacle. Thank God for that. Oh, there isn't a wilderness. But God hath his ministering angel to meet me and to help me. Indeed, God himself comes to the wilderness. Oh, how precious are the words of Rita Snowden. You recall what she said if you read our book, The Dawn. God's forgiveness is just God trusting me again in the place where I disgrace him. Isn't that wonderful? God trusting me again in the place where I disgrace him. Is that the place you're in today? Is that the consciousness that is gripping you now? That you have disobeyed and in your disobedience you have dishonored God. Oh, I'll never forget the cry of a schoolmaster in Louis. He at one time loved the Saviour as a young lad, he professed faith in Jesus Christ, went to university in Glasgow, and while there lost out, and backslid to terrible death. During the revival, indeed it was in a dance, he was head of a concert party at that concert and dance God swept into the dance swept in 
Young men and women fled from the floor, gripped by the fear of God. One man described it thus, I felt the flames of hell licking my very soul as I fled from that den of iniquity. Speaking of this dance, this concert, and God's visitation, this headmaster was found on his face on the floor, crying, God, is there forgiveness for me? Is there forgiveness for me? Hell is too good for me. That's conviction. That's God at work. But listen, on that dance floor, God came to him again. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Yes, he's in a wilderness. But there he built a tabernacle and registered a new beginning. I want to tell you what that man said, speaking at a testimony meeting in connection with one of our communion seasons. You see, in the Highlands, Friday is given over uh, to testimony. You must have a testimony to the saving grace of God before you're allowed to sit at the Lord's table. I would that was impressed upon people everywhere. The Lord's table wouldn't be cluttered with men that are living in sin. I say that as a Presbyterian minister. This man is giving his testimony. And this is what he says. If there is one thing that lies heavy upon my spirit, it is this. But during those years of backsliding, I helped the devil to damn the young people of the parish. Oh, my dear people, help the devil. If I'm not gathering, I'm scattering. If I'm not living for God, I'm living for the devil. If I'm not winning souls for Christ, I'm winning them for the devil. I care not what I profess. And that was the truth that gripped him and troubled him. The number of young people that, he, that were living in sin and he said that day I believe some of them are in hell because of my disobedience. And yet God came to him and God spoke the word of forgiveness. And God made him again. Oh, thank God for the gospel of a second chance that you today in this convention can register a new beginning, can build a tabernacle in your wilderness and know the glorious truth relative to the vessel marred that can be made again. I remember one of the elders in Louis saying to me after the great awakening in the parish of Barber, he said, Mr. Campbell, you must have lived for this day and now you will live in the memory of it. 
Of course I knew what the dear man meant. I'm sure he was thinking of the rest and the joy and the peace that must have flooded the soul in seeing prayer answered and God moving. But is that the real thing? Oh, is that the real thing? I say a thousand times no. The real thing is to be so in the will of God that today surprises in the realm of grace makes yesterday's experience but a commonplace. Each day registering a new beginning with God. Now let me say, and I wish this to be clearly understood, that the gospel of a new beginning is only possible as an expression of God himself. Nature knows nothing of it. It is a fixed rule in nature that if any of her laws be broken, there attaches to the one who breaks them a permanent disability. And this too is contrary to the spirit of the world. Oh, the world worships power. Success is its deed. But let a man fail, let a man break down, let a man fall, be it in business or out of business, he seldom, if ever, gets another chance. He's down, keep him down. That's the spirit of the age. Oh, he seldom gets a frank, a fool, and a free forgiveness that sets him again on the way of life, humbled, humbled, but inspired. I was preaching at the mound in Edinburgh some little time ago, and after a message, a young man came to me. Oh, he was in trouble. He was just released from prison. He was a very clever young man, highly educated. But in an evil hour yielded to temptation and found himself behind prison bars. You know what he said to me? I walked Edinburgh during the past week seeking employment. And when I tell the truth to them, no one will have me. No one will have me. And I looked at him and said, young man, I know one that will have you. Hallelujah. I know one that will have you. His face lit up. Oh, he says, tell me, tell me, who is he? Is he in Edinburgh? Yes, I says, and he's at the mound. He's here now. Here now? Could I speak to him there? Yeah. You can speak to him. Would you like to go on your knees on my coat here? And we'll talk to him. And then it dawned on what I meant. And a cloud came over his face. And I stood beside him and I prayed. And then he said, Do you think that he would help me? Oh, I felt now I, I, I'm getting there. Do you think that he will help me? Yes, I said he will. 
on one condition and on one condition only that you repent of your sin and accept him as your saviour listen just like a flash he said Mr. Campbell my parents have been praying for me I'll do that now and he did it and today he's in employment and doing well oh thank God it may not be the spirit of the world but blessed be God that's how Jesus acts he comes and he meets me at the very point of my knee and he organizes victory for me on the very ground of my defeat and there oh bless God there I can register a new beginning Oh, the inspiration of I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten and ye shall know I am in the midst of Israel. I believe, dear people, that listening to me this morning there are those to whom God is speaking you know where you have failed him young man you know young woman you know and as you listen to me there is within your heart Oh, such a longing to be real, to be real. My appeal these days is for reality, for reality, in godliness, in holiness, in vital Christian living. Oh, how desperate is the need. People today talk about the need of a new technique. I'm tired listening. A new approach in the field of evangelism. So in Edinburgh, they've introduced the dance on Sunday evening. In one of our churches, reputed to be evangelic. Oh, God help us. This is the new approach. That is why I say I'm tired listening. It's not a new approach or a new technique. For a new visitation of God through consecrated godly living. That's what we need today. Oh, give us that in our churches. Give us men and women possessed by God. Let me tell you a story illustrating what I mean. During the revival I had a letter from an atheist. He was headmaster of one of our schools, an atheist. Would you call? I'm anxious to have a talk with you. People with whom I stayed were amazed, surprised that I should receive a letter from this desperate man. So I called. In course of conversation, he said this. Would you prove to me, or could you prove to me logically that there is a God? <laughs> prove to you logically. I wouldn't attempt it. I wouldn't attempt it. No, I... I wouldn't attempt to prove to you logically that there is a God. Because... Finite mind can never grasp the infinite. The world by wisdom knew not God. 
But if you wish to be introduced to the God that I believe in, to the God that saved me, and to the God that is real to me now, spend half a day in the village of Arno. And I can still see that proud atheist bow his head. I can see the tears streaming from his eyes as he said, did you say half a day? Half an hour did it. I was in that village yesterday and I met little Donald McPhail. Who was little Donald McPhail? A lad of 16 years of age who was gloriously saved the night the revival swept through that community. A fortnight after that, Donald, young Donald, was out on the hills tending some cattle. He is praying as he lay among the heather. And suddenly, God, the Holy Ghost, fell upon him. He was baptized into Christ, kneeling by a peat sack the night that God visited the village. On the hillside, explain it as you will, give it any term you like, he was baptized by the Holy Ghost, by Christ. And so baptized that he couldn't rise from the ground. And his parents found him there. His mother said, Donald, we've been looking for you for hours. Oh, mother, leave me. I'm having an audience with the king. Think of that. A boy of 16 years of age. I may say that he is today a minister and a missionary in southern Arabia and seeing a wonderful work done among the Arabs. Yes. That was the last that met the proud schoolman. And when he met him, he met God. He met God. God expressing himself through holy personality. That's it. That's the impact. Now I tell you another story about that young lad. It was the following week. He is again leading the cattle out of the village uh, to the moor in just as he is passing through the village gate, a coach, a bus from the town stopped and a young man alight. He is carrying two cases. He is just home from Australia. He is a sailor. No, he knew nothing about the revival. He was on the sea when revival west his district he is home for a short holiday he is carrying two heavy kids young Donald goes over to him Norman we are glad to see you home especially at such a time now that was all it said that was all that he said passed on with the cattle by the time Norman got to his home, he was in the grip of deep conviction. Something laid hold of him that he never experienced before and he kept repeating to himself, I'm quoting him now, I'm quoting him. He kept repeating, oh my God, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. 
Won't you see me? No, he hadn't heard about the revival. He hadn't heard that God had swept into the village some weeks before. But he's now in an environment where the supreme reality is God. That revival. He went to the home. His mother met him at the door and embraced him. We're glad to see you home, Norman. You see, he had been away for two years. Oh, mother, won't you pray for me? Won't you pray for me? Norman, we have need to pray for ourselves. As yet God hadn't visited that home. I believe God ordained that what I'm now going to tell you was to happen. The mother said, Norman, no, we have much need to pray for ourselves, but your old companion was saved last night, and I'll ask him in to pray for you. And she went, and she asked this young man, the neighbor, to come in, and that young lad, young man, thus born again on the previous evening, poured out his heart that God might save Norman. And God saved Norman. And God saved Norman's father, Norman's mother, Norman's two brothers and two sisters within an hour. That's God. Oh, that's God. Because the Holy Ghost, the power of the Spirit, he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And the Holy Ghost came upon that young lad. We frequently speak of him as the Evan Roberts of Louis. I believe more souls were saved through his prayer. And through the preaching and the prayer of every minister in Louis be among them. God came, empowered him, set him free. And he could say, leave me, mother, I'm having an audience with the king. You see, he was living in high places with God. And it's in the high place, my brother, that the miracle happens. It doesn't happen down here. Oh, to get to high altitude at this convention. To get to high places with God. And then the miracle happens. And the tabernacle is built in the wilderness. And the community sees a new beginning. And God marching gloriously as hell is made to sink back before the presence of the Lord of life. Oh, may God grant it. May God grant it. Amen.